Franz Kafka, chapter 5. Dostoevsky's prophecy that anything will be permitted if man gives up believing in God. Nietzsche's quote-unquote universal madness predicted for the coming age of atheism. These apply to the world of soundless and swift disaster in Kafka, who was neither an atheist nor capable of rallying himself to a strong affirmation of his Jewish faith. Kafka's men are living in that world without God, of which Nietzsche predicted that it would be somehow older, strange, and suspicious a late hour of mankind. Apart from minor characters, Kafka's marionettes are either victims or executioners. Totalitarianism, as it swept over Central Europe ten years after Kafka's death, treated Jews and political nonconformists like vermin, to be annihilated or abandoned like George Samsa in Metamorphosis. It is interesting to remember in this connection that Dostoevsky's Superman, Raskolnikov, before murdering the pawnbroker, heard his friend speaking of her as, quote, a louse, a black beetle, close quote, a remark that influenced him to think of his crime as, quote, an experiment, close quote a term not unknown to the Nazi vocabulary of concentration camp, quote-unquote, medicine. Totalitarianism held mock trials such as Joseph K. had in the trial. As in the castle, there was no recourse to the remote lord of justice for whom Kafka longed, but only a distant silence or vague laughter. The dead have not been laid to rest. The conscience of generations will be pained by their return to conscious memory. As the hunter of Gracchus, innocent of any guilt of his own, continues to visit the living. Gunther Anders, one of Kafka's German interpreters, likens Kafka's technique to that of Aesop, whose fables were meant to convey the lesson that men are like animals. Therefore, Aesop makes animals act like men. Kafka, in a similar inversion of reality, makes the terrible seem natural because he considers the natural terrible. The sense of suspense in Kierkegaard, Dostoevsky, and Nietzsche has now become a motion downward, no longer to be arrested. The world is a dark beyond, an uncontrollable autonomy of horror without moral rules or recognizable significance. Our moral code no longer suffices to master it, and there is no way out. And since we do not know its laws, we all are guilty. It would, however, be unfair to ascribe to Kafka the conscious proclamation of contempt for morality or theism. If one wants to find a message in his work, then his little fable of the couriers a piece of less than a hundred words conveys it effectively. The people had the choice of becoming kings or the king's couriers. After the manner of children, the Grand Inquisitor speaks of men as irresponsible children. They all wanted to be couriers who had no vision of a king's responsibilities and no desire to assume moral leadership. Now the world is full of couriers who are shouting senseless messages at each other. They realize this state of affairs but refrain from committing suicide because of their oath of service and loyalty. The, quote, much too many, close quote, continue to live morally because of fear and obedience, not from inner freedom. Their message is without meaning parentheses, or moral strength, close parentheses, and all is anxiety and despair. A good deal of theorizing about Kafka's philosophy has searched for the theological camouflage that his work is supposed to represent, guilt, punishment, and the unbridgeable chasm between the lord and the castle, and the despairing visitor suggests some relationship between Bart's unfathomable otherness and remoteness of God. Kafka's Jewishness has been quoted as the basic motive for his radical denial of resurrection and salvation. The Jewish God, so argues, for example, the Catholic Ignaz 
Zanderle is not the ever-present God of Christianity, but has disappeared behind his laws. He is at best an idea, a burning bush, a faint memory, but not a person. The impressive absence of hope in Kafka's work gives it the most telling note if one looks for religious symbolism. All of Kafka's characters have lost the paradise of God's nearness. Eternity has been replaced by endlessness. Kierkegaard's paradox of God's love for man is centered. This center of all faith, absurd and unbelievable to our human logic, this love is alien to Kafka's thinking. Absent, therefore, is the mysterious act of forgiveness, which is one of Kierkegaard's axioms and Dostoevsky's ever-repeated resurrection miracle. J Job's loneliness and despair reign, but God is missing. Kafka's story represents the extreme polarity of Vorgin's Legenda Aoroia, the golden book of legends of medieval saints. They are the Legenda Negra. His characters are made to live in the Viva Negativa, and one may well call his fascinating and disquieting work the anti-gospel of Nietzsche's post-Christian era.